Okay, great. Good, good, good. Okay, this is this is my one of my team leaders here who's doing this. Uh, my slides for me, you know. So we may be. Yeah, we will work together on it anyway. I'm Carol Gino. I'm a best-selling author. But first, I was a nurse for a thousand years, and being a nurse was the thing that sort of propelled me into writing because after 16 to 20 years of uh, not being able to have people have enough information about the choices they were making, my feeling was I had to be able to reach more people. And so that's what I did. I said, I have to go to writing school, knew nothing. Took a couple of courses at New School for uh, Social Research in, the, in New York City. And then as destiny would have it, uh, I got called to a private duty case, which was Mario Puzo, whose wife was dying of cancer. And so I didn't wanna go and then the agent kept saying to me, but you have to go because they want one of their own and she's dying, so you have to go. And I thought, oh God, he wrote The Godfather. I can't believe that. I'm an artist, ardent feminist, and I'm gonna to have to look at this man. I can't believe this. And okay, finally, she said, you have to do it because this woman needs you. So I said, okay, what's her name? And they said, Erica. I said, Erica, that's Italian? And they said, oh, no, no, she's German. He's Italian. I said, well, how does that make sense for me? And they said, well, he loved her, so they want you. That's how that whole thing went. We spent three months together, and I must tell you that I admired him as a husband and a father, uh, as a man, much more, and still, though he's a great, a great storyteller. But who he is as a man was much more impressive. Um, so we were together for about three months and stuff like that before Erica died. And after that, we got together a lot because I wanted to be a writer and I had taken a couple of courses and he said, I wouldn't want anyone I love to be a writer. And I said, why? I thought it was your biggest passion. He said, well, it is. He says, but it's too tough a job, too much rejection. He said, I mean, it was awful. He had written two literary classics. They were hailed as minor cl classics and he got $5,000 altogether on them. And it was 15 years after that, that he finally decided he had to support his family. So he sold out and wrote The Godfather. But, uh, Sherry, what's the next slide on this I'm looking at? Ah, yes. So what happened was he, after I took care of his wife with a couple of my friends who were also nurses, Mario said to me, you really should write a story and tell people what nurses do because people have no idea. He says, and really you saved me on the first night you came to take care of Erica. So I said to him, Right, I was writing to patients, not for nurses. He said, people need to know what nurses do. They have no idea that nurses save your life, doctors don't. So I started to write and I said, but I don't know how. And he said, just write. I said, well, teach me then. He said, no, writing can't be taught, but it can be learned. I said, what do, I, what do you need to tell me so I can tell you that I can learn anything like that. He said, bring me a couple of stories and let me look at them. So I brought him a couple of, sto couple of stories and he was sitting on his chair with his feet on his desk and he looked at them and he paged through them really quick. And he said, you sure you wanna be a writer? I said, I'm positive. He said, okay. He said, I'll tell you this, you've got a voice, you're able to capture a voice, you got an eye, now you've got to learn the carpentry. I said, the carpentry? He said, yep, the nuts and bolts. And I said, well, are you going to help me? And he said, I can't help you. He said, I'll tell you what I know, and then you have to put it into terms that works for you. 
And that's how it worked. He really didn't help me with mine and I didn't help him with his, except as anybody would if they were, like he said to me, if you weren't such a good writer, you could be a great editor. And he was the same for me. He'd say, don't use dialogue if it doesn't move the narrative forward. And uh, make sure if you use narrative, it tells you something about the character or the interaction between the characters. And then I said, but I have no idea where to begin and no idea where to end. And he said, well, what you do is just start. And I said, start where? He said, what comes to mind when you think of what you wanna write? I said, how heroic my patients were and how ordinary people are so heroic that in extraordinary circumstances, which look ordinary, they live heroic and extraordinary lives. He said, so start writing about them. And I said, which one? He said, did you ever go to a quilting class? And I said, me, are you kidding? No. And so he said, well, imagine it then. He said, just write a patch, whatever patch comes to your mind. When you're finished with all you have to say, then throw it down and take a look at it and see which patches make the kind of pattern you want. Just make sure that you have good hook at the beginning, an engine and a good payoff. He said, your reader is gonna forgive you for some of the stuff you do in the middle. So it took me three years to write the nurse's story. I cried a lot and I realized a lot, a lot about writing that I had no clue about before because I could only let those stories go once I had validated them by putting them down. When I wrote the nurse's story, <clears throat> it wasn't, it, I don't even know how it got. I sent it to an agent, an agent caught, contacted an editor. I got $6,500 advance on it. <clears throat> I handed them 750 pages. <clears throat> And all they did was look at me and laugh. It took us another half a year to edit it. And every time they pulled a chunk out, all I did was cry. I said, oh no, you're pulling out the best parts. And they said, no, no, this works, this works. Finally, they got it from 700 pages to 350, 750 to 350. And I don't know, I just don't, I remember the book clubs wanted it. Everybody wanted it. There were dumpsters in the stores. I did all kinds of tours. And Mario, as I said, gave me a testimonial on the paperback, which came out then a year after than the nurses. The original color, cover of the nurses story is to the left. And they were fighting first. I handed it in saying, unseen struggles, unheard screams. And they said, no, no, no. They were going Chaucerian. They decided to call it the nurse's tale. And for me, that sounded like the steward's tale and flew right into the stereotypes of nurses as sex objects and stuff. So we had another six months to fight over. You can't use tale, you have to use story. And then when Bantam bought it for, God, I think they won an auction and they must have gotten $82,000 for the paperback rights of a book they paid me 6,000 in advance. And then it sold to the book clubs and everything else. And I got a lot of really, really good reviews from regular people. And the nursing ap academics killed me. The girls, in the, the girls and guys in the trenches passed it around. The people bought it. Everybody loved it. And I went to, it was really funny because I went to update it now to re-release it because it has sold. And I was lucky enough to be smart enough at that time to want reversion rights, which right now, at that time, it was only written if a book was out of publication for a year, then... Uh, they would revert or three years, then they would revert. Well, at that time I asked in the contract for reversion rights after three years. Lucky I did because if print 
you know, if print, print on demand was there now, I would not have been able to get these back so that I could self-publish them, you know. Okay, Sherry on the next one here. Yeah, this is, this is some of the stuff after the, pub, the nurse's story was published and I started to, I wanna say help Mario. Uh, with the writing when it didn't make sense, we brainstorm a lot. But if you look at this picture down here in the red, he used to put everything in charts on top there. He used to have charts all over. And what he used to do is hang these oak tag charts that I used to have to write out all around his room. And he'd look at them and look at them and look at them. And if something looked out of place, then he'd move it around so that the patches of his quilt started looking good. This one up here was in the upper right sitting, that was in Burgess Meredith's house where we both had uh, desks on opposite side in Malibu where he used to go to make deals with the movie companies. And every year when we had to go there, we used to have to go to Malibu and we'd rent somebody's house from December 28th to April so that we could leave Mar uh, Malibu and go to the film festivals in Cannes and then go to England and France and then come back to Malibu. And you had to hear what a dope I was because you wouldn't have believed it. Every year when I had a pack to go to Malibu, I used to say, do we have to go again? I really don't want to go. I want to tell you, we had people there making us lunch, doing everything for us. And I can't tell you how useless I felt. <laughs> it was really, it was. So when we went to Con in 80, that's in the Grand Hotel, this one up on the top left. And we were standing on a balcony there and it was both there and in Malibu. And I tell this story in my last book, uh, which is me and Mario, but that's where we're looking out over the water and there's these big boats and there's beautiful palm trees. And after all, it's Malibu. And, and that was France. And we look at both places, both times, he looked at me and he said, well, honey, take a look. This is as good as it gets. And I looked at him and I said, this is as good as it gets? Really? <laughs> because the thing that you forget as you're growing is that wherever you go, you bring the you, you are with you. So I was, while I was seeing all this beauty, I was still the nurse who was on private duty practically and never, and looked around at all this wealth and riches and thought there are people suffering. And Mario used to say, and they will suffer whether you suffer with them or not. So these, the reasons, this down here to the left was when I gave him a party when the Sicilian came out because the Sicilian, we barely got back with my life. Sherry, is there another, is there another one of those or should I tell the story now about the Sicilian? Did we put anything in the slides about that? Ah. Uh, that was after, no, take me back to the original slides then because I have a couple of other stories of that. Yeah, this one, what happened is when we went to, we were studying, researching the Sicilian and we went to Palermo, but as soon as we got off of the um, plane, the embassy, the Roman embassy came to get us and take us there and it was really very, very mafia-like, let me tell you. They got us and they brought us up and they said something to us like, we have been uh, given word that those who need to know you're coming, know you're coming. So if you need anything, let us know because the Giuliani family is not happy that you're coming. So we promised we let them go. Mario said, don't worry about it. We'll let you know know everything we're doing. We had an escort from the publishing house that met us downstairs. We went downstairs and um, the, the, the escort's name was Giuseppe, Joseph. And so we get in the car 
And Mario says to Joseph, take us to Montalepre. And I said, isn't that, what the, isn't that what the guy from the embassy just said was dangerous? And Mario said, yeah, but we'll be in and out before you know it. So there we go, down the roads past the all the, oh my God, you have never been to such a scary place. I mean, there were all these places where the bandit had hidden and everything. And we get into this town and it was the scariest thing. Everything in the town was uh, shuttered. And as we came into the town, we had to go down. Mario said to Joseph and I, get out, stand behind me, don't get close and act as though you're a tourist. So I had my camera and I said, okay. And we're walking through the town. Mario's walking ahead with a big long cigar and he's looking around and I'm noting, noticing that the plaque but the uh, shutters are opening and opening and opening and people are looking and there's these old men playing bocce and they look at Mario and he just nods like the godfather would nods and they all <gasps> go like that and everybody looks down, you know, <laughs> it was, well, anyway, we got out of there and we safely, so to speak, but on the way out, we had to take pictures of the cemetery where Giuliani and his best friend Pucciati were buried. And there were all these big old mausoleums and stuff, only there was no way in. The gates were locked and over the top, like Italians do, it said, we were once as you are, you will be as we are. And Mario said to Joseph, do you think if we pick her up, she could sort of jump over the fence and take some pictures? And so uh, I said, you're both going to throw me over the fence. And so they picked me up and Mario said, here, take this hundred dollars. And if you see any kind of, if you see a, a gatekeeper there, offer him the money, maybe he'll let us in. So he must have heard them because he came to the door. You want to hear a funny thing in the middle of this whole thing? Neither Mario or I understood or could speak Italian. So all Mario would do is nod every once in a while and everybody would be terrified. But anyhow, this gatekeeper came to the door and let us in while I was up on the on that big bridge. But I have pictures of that in the book and everything too. Um, I learned a lot. I really did because it was like, that was the first idea I had about what it took to market and do publicity and stuff because Whenever the um, people were coming to interview Mario, I would want to go with him because I'd say, I want to hear what journalists ask you and everything. And he kept saying, no, you stay with Joseph, go shopping, stay in the hotel or something. And I'd say, you're ashamed to be seen with me. And he'd say, it has nothing to do with being afraid to be seen with you. And I said, I don't see anything that would make any other sense. And he said, my dear, he said, I told you the deal breaker between us, the same as you told me, was nothing comes between us and our kids. Well, the thing is that if you get kidnapped and I get your ear back in a box, there goes my kid's inheritance. He said, but if you do what you can and stay with Joseph, I promise you, I'll buy your earrings, but I want to be able to buy two. So. That's what happened to me in Sicily anyway, when we went to research the Sicilian anyway. Uh, Sherry, what's the next? Uh, yeah, this is the, oh, Mario hated having pictures taken. And about the Godfather, he used to say that what he did was he wrote literature the first two times and didn't make enough to support his family. So everybody in his family was calling him a chooch, which meant somebody who couldn't afford his family. Well, after that, he said what happened is he studied the bestseller list and he was determined to write a bestseller. That's when he wrote The Godfather. He said, I did the right thing, I sold out because he said it brought me to my true gift of storytelling. But still, he said his, his, in his heart, he always thought of himself as a literary man. And that's what he won 
is Oscar for. And like he said, he says, people will probably remember me for the book I sold out on uh, rather than the books that I love. And I have to tell you, for me, my favorite book of his, which is the best woman's book I ever read, is The Fortunate Pilgrim. And that's as close to his autobiography as you could come. And what he said in that was he realized that while he looked down on the poor peasants in Hell's Kitchen and his mom and his sister, he realized that those people were the people who were the real heroes of his book because they shouldn't have uh, indulged him in his eccentricity. The last picture, the picture under that, is the picture that I took before I tried to convince him. Everybody always wanted him to uh, do marketing and do a tour. And while I had to do three tours cross country for my books, he never would until 1996 when we had finished The Last Dawn. And then I said, hey, if I'm right, and there is reincarnation, and you come back, what do you want to be? He said, a baseball player. I said, really? He said, I told you, I always wanted to be a baseball player. I said, okay. I said, then you better start doing publicity because baseball players, you need a jump, you need an edge on that. He said, no, I hate my pictures. So I said, well, let me take a bunch of pictures of you. And if you hate them, then we won't go. But if I can get some you like, then let's tour so we prepare for next life. So he said, God, he says, you're so crazy. He said, but you're more competent than anybody I know, so okay. The bottom picture that I got, I think looks the most like Marlon Brando when he got in touch with Marlon Brando uh, about The Godfather because he said he was so horrified that they wanted, uh, that Danny Thomas wanted to play it. And though Danny Thomas was a lovely man, he wasn't the godfather. <laughs> so that was why I have this here. Hey, Sharon, next. Great. So these are the books that even I chose next to the godfather, because these are the books that sold for me, that really sold. Most people only know about the godfather, but the others were books that Hey, and people, hey, when he didn't write another Godfather after this, they all thought I was writing for him. And I said, why would people think that I would write your kind of book? I write to heal. I don't write this stuff. And he says to me, yes. But he says, unless a writer can show the dark side of humanity with a certain affection, he said, nobody can own their shadow, he said. So though it may not look like that, he said, I, he says, I write to do the same thing you do. The one thing I want you to know here is that the one book that isn't here is a book, and I'm gonna say this without any commentary today, just because the book is called The Fourth K. And in it, this book was about, he was real visionary in this. It was about America okay, electing a fascist president because they were too arrogant to believe that they could be fooled in that way. They thought their eyes were opened and it was a cautionary tale for all of us. And I would say that the problem with that book is Mario was terribly loyal and Joni Evans was his publisher and he loved Joni, so we went with Joni. And Michael Corder was a guy I didn't like, but he knew about male power. And that's the thing that should have been in that too. But I think that all these things play. They, that book got buried pretty quickly for him. You know, so that book never sold the way the others did, you know? Okay, Cher, next. Okay, this is when, when this is, there's two pictures here. One of these pictures, and I think I can't find the other, but this was served. You know, that one of these was, he's signing books because we had at Britannos in Hollywood, we had this big book signing. And it was right after we had signed um, 
a movie deal with uh, one of the big moguls in Hollywood. But what happened is when Mario looked and there were so many people on lines uh, waiting for his signature because he signed every one of them and took a long time talking to everybody because uh, he had never done tours like this before. So there were long wides, lines even with people with babies and stuff. So Mario insisted Lynetta, his girl, make sure he ordered everybody pizza so they wouldn't have to wait online without eating. <laughs> but that was very Mario, you know. Uh, that was one of his big things. Okay, Cher, next one. Okay. I took care of Mario and this is the first 10 years we traveled all over the place and saw the beauty of the world. And I did my books and I did a lot of touring for Nurse's Story, Rusty Story. Then an angel came was when my grandson died and I like to think of myself as at that time of giving voice to the voiceless. And there were so many people who had babies who died of SIDS and stuff were being accused of, uh, you know, child abuse and stuff. So I spent a couple of years and really researched that. And so then I wrote, then an angel came. Rusty's story was about a girl with epilepsy who they misdiagnosed as having being paranoid schizophrenic and yet she had epilepsy and I